This is your urgent call to action. We are all called to lead in a world in chaos, crisis, and turmoil. Join a pivotal global movement for change to transform the leadership crisis worldwide. Will you play it safe, or will you wake up, step up, and speak out? Like Nelson Mandela did for South Africa and the world, we need a radical new way to think, act, and lead, leading boldly into the future. Join host Ann Pratt, a Harvard fellow and multi-awarded businesswoman, and unlock the best version of yourself to revolutionize leadership with what the world needs now. Greetings to all you future bold leaders. Thank you for joining us from around the world. My name is Ann Pratt, formerly from South Africa, and relocated abroad to attend a Harvard Leadership Fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States of America. Our bold leader joins us today from Little Rock, the capital city of Arkansas in the United States of America, and also the home of the Bill Clinton Presidential Library and Museum. She is a powerful woman, a gracious woman, and a humble woman who has traveled all the way from the cotton fields of Arkansas to the White House. She is a highly respected author, publisher, and educator who has written or co-written 17 books, including her first, the critically applauded Cottonfield of Dreams, a memoir and a tribute to her wonderful parents and her close-knit family with 18 siblings. In 2014, she co-founded the Celebrate Maya Project to celebrate and educate the youth of Arkansas on the life and legacy of the great global icon, Maya Angelou, also a daughter of the state of Arkansas. Stay with us as we listen and learn about some defining childhood moments and powerful moments in the White House, meeting multiple heads of states, including defining moments with President Bill Clinton and President Nelson Mandela. The little known story and childhood pain of the late and great Maya Angelou and how she turned pain into purpose and her mute, voiceless period in her life into one of the most powerful voices of our time. We warmly welcome Janice Kearney and welcome to Leading Boldly into the Future. So Janice, what a great honor to meet with you today. I'm so delighted to be able to talk to you and have a conversation around leading boldly into the future and the wonderful work that you're doing in the great state of Arkansas. Thank you so much for joining us. It is absolutely my pleasure and thank you for inviting me. I wondered, and, and you know, I was curious about your, your memoir, I wondered if you could share something about, you know, the cotton field of dreams, your personal memoir. What inspired you to write the book? My memoir was something I actually started very young. Uh, I fell in love with writing from listening to my father's stories. He shared stories all during our childhood, and I absolutely was immersed in that. So I knew I wanted to be a writer from very early on, and I wanted to be a storyteller because that's what he was. Uh, and the first book I wanted to write was about my father and about my family. And I kept that dream Throughout my life, uh, I would write a little bit and work. I always had to have a job because, you know, I needed to live. But writing was always my passion. Uh, so Cottonfield of Dreams was something I knew I wanted to write after I kind of finished doing all the other things that uh, came my way as far as my journey. Uh, I ended up in Chicago, and that's when I started my writing career. Um, and Cotton Field of Dreams was the first book that I wanted to put out into the world. And I considered it a love letter to my parents about their heart life and how they were able to produce uh, what many people consider very successful family. There were 19 children. And of those 19 children, 18 went to college and we all dreamed and we ended up doing in life, what we dreamed of doing. And that's thanks completely to TJ and Ethel Kearney, my parents. 
That is such an inspiring story, Janice. I'm curious, you know, and you make the powerful point that we all need dreams and hopes. And often the children of, uh, I think, Mississippi, and of course, um, I think it's the area of uh, the Delta region and Arkansas, right. some of the poorest regions of, of the country, yes. um, are often the children that most need examples and uh and and mentors and role models of people who turned, you know, who are still able to hang on to those dreams and find hope and inspiration of what is possible. I, I wonder if you have a moment in your own life that you could take us back to, a moment where perhaps it was difficult and hard to keep that hope and dream alive. What was that moment? Uh, how did you feel at the time? Um, I, I often go back to a moment when I was 15 years old and my mother and father had been gone like a day and came back. My father actually came back and said, your mother, uh, you know, she'll be back tomorrow. Basically, that's what he said. So my mom came back the next day and my dad called me into the room with them, the two of them, and told me my mother had cancer. Uh, oh. She had to have one breast removed and I had to take care of her. I needed to take care of her. At the time, I was the oldest girl uh, there at home and that became my responsibility. And that was absolutely uh, horrifying for me because my mother was basically our family's capstone. She was everything. And mm -hmm. I was given the responsibility of helping her live basically at 15 years old. So that, that really, I think it changed me. I was basically a shy, quiet girl who probably didn't have very much self-confidence. Uh, but at that point I had to step up and I, I pulled on everything that I'd been taught all my life. Um, you know, the, the faith, the hard work, the self-confidence, the dreams, the hopes, all of that I had to pull on to help my mother and become her caretaker, basically, uh, as well as continue to do well in school. So that was a, a life changer for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that, Janice. And it's, I mean, quite a, a remarkable responsibility for a woman at a a young girl at such a, a young age. If you could share with us, what were those other support systems that you tapped into to help you navigate what must have been an incredibly difficult time? I really think my faith really was something that was so helpful to me. It helped strengthen me during that time. And, you know, I became extremely close to my mother and we would talk a lot and she would share, you know, her wisdoms about life, about how you navigate life. Uh, so I think it was her wisdom. It was my faith uh, that I'd actually gotten from them. They had passed that on to me and my sense of, you know, if you have a job, you do it. You find a way to do it. Uh, yeah. which had, was also a value that had been taught by my parents. So I relied on all of that. And, you know, that sense of responsibility, um, there's no substitute for it, really. Uh, if you you are given a job or a responsibility, you take it seriously and you do your very best to uh, to do it well. And I I wanted to save my mother. I wanted my mother to be around. So I took all of that very seriously. Um, so I think the values that my parents taught us so early, um, all of those things that stay with me now have gone with me all of these years. Those are the things that help me, you know, transform or, or be able to get past that point of having saved my mother. And thankfully she, she was fine for quite a while, for 10 years and um, um, enjoyed her life, continued to enjoy her life. Yes, yes. What a great gift to her and to you. And, um, you know, I, you know, moving forward in your life, I mean, you've not only written your beautiful memoir, but you've gone on to craft 
many other pieces of, of great work. What is the piece that, that you're most proud of? What is the piece, the literary piece that you think has had the most impact? That's very hard. It's kind of like asking, which of your children do you like the best? I don't yeah. know. Well, yeah. but I have to say Cotton Field of Dreams, my first memoir, meant so much to my whole family, all of us, because we are we we're a stoic kind of people. We don't talk a lot about emotions and uh, we don't express it a lot. So mm -hmm. the fact that I was able to write a lot of what we felt and what we experienced they appreciated that so much. It was the scariest experience because I always wondered what are my family going to think about this? But all of them responded to me and said, thank you. Thank you for sharing our story, for making us remember, making us appreciate. So I think it impacted my family in a wonderful way, but it also impacted so many people. And in a lot of different ways, but one of the very important ways is that I talked about a sister who had mental problems and eventually took her life. And I talked about that very openly in the book. And I didn't expect to get any really real responses from that. I got so many responses. People would call me, they would email me, they would write me to say thank you for sharing this. Because in the African-American community, those are things we don't talk about. We don't talk yeah. about mental illness. Well, we do more now, but back then we certainly didn't. And we didn't certainly didn't talk about suicide. So they were so grateful that I had brought that out. I had been courageous enough, they said, to bring that out and to share something so personal uh, with the world. And I, I just never knew it would impact people the way that it did. You know, Janice, I think you've touched on such an important point. And, and, and I'm so sorry about the loss of your sister and I. I think it's incredibly courageous for you to share with the world. And so often in the world of life and leadership today, we see those things, those vulnerable exposures as weakness mm -hmm. rather than strength. So I'm curious about your perspective in terms of what bold, courageous leadership looks like today. And how do we need to change the paradigm in terms of what is strength and what is weakness? That's a great question. I think when you're talking about leadership, you're talking about being human first. And I can only speak from that because I never think of myself as a leader. I think of myself as a human being who tries to get up and do what is the right thing to do each day. And you hope that a leader would do the same thing. Uh, you would hope that having the responsibility that many leaders do that they would take seriously that the way that they run their com company, the way that they uh, treat the people who work with them and for them, that that makes a huge difference in the way that people look at our country, look at the community, look at leadership. Um, so I, I think that the strength in a leadership is their being able to be as human as possible, to do the things that impact humanity, to make decisions based on making the world better, making the community better, making the people who they work with better. Uh, I think if we can think like that as leaders, then we create a better world. Uh, when we're thinking of always just making money or making a name for ourselves or beating out someone else, then we're leaving out the most important part. And that's that's my my thought on leadership. That's why I think because I have a lot of models for bad leadership or, or negative leadership, I really don't ever want to consider myself a leader. I just want to consider myself as someone who does the right thing every day, as long as I can, as much as I can. Yeah, I, I think that's such a powerful message. Just kind of building on that a little, and you alluded to the fact that there are you know, many examples of perhaps not such great leaders. What are the kind of three big leadership challenges that we face, not only in America, but, but in the world today? What are the three big things that keep you 
up at night concerned or perhaps wanting to write about? Oh, God, I wish there were just three. <laughs> but I think politics scares me. The, the, the um, shape of politics, the direction of politics, it is very scary to me um, because I grew up, my father would always talk to us about politicians and politics. He would rail about, you know, the negatives about politics. So I didn't really like politics growing up. And then I got to a point where I accepted politics and I actually learned that politics can be good and there are good politicians. We just have to be very careful about who we put into leadership. So I went yeah. that way. That's how I got into politics. That's how I ended up working for a president uh, of the United States. I decided that politics could be good. And if you have the right person, then it could be helpful for everyone, the whole country. So um, I think these last probably 20 years, I've had to rethink all of that. Yes, I do know there are good politicians and good politics is good for the country, but we're going in the wrong direction. And I think most of us can see it and we feel hopeless, um, you know, as far as changing it, redirecting it. Uh, so right now I'm scared. I'm horrified for the politics of our life. And, and I, you know, I watch TV. I know what's going on all over the world. Yeah. It's not just yeah. here. Um, yeah. so I, I, you know, I grapple with that and I worry about that. And I guess the other things is poverty. And I know poverty doesn't just impact, uh, Arkansas and the Delta poverty is all over the world. The, yeah. the cans and cannot, the, the gap is getting wider. That bothers yeah. me. That means that there's a few people in this world who make the decisions. They can make the decisions about the rest of the world. That's yeah. not the way I think it should be, but yeah. it seems like that's the direction that it's going. And I worry about our young people because our young people are seeing all of this that I'm, I'm talking about. They're seeing it, seeing it, ingesting it, and they're making their decisions about life and their futures based on what they see. And you can only pray that they're saying, I want to change things. I don't want things to be like this. Um, but are they hopeless? Are they feeling that they don't have enough uh, you know, value or power to be able to change things? So I worry about the, the mental, you know, uh, stability of our children when they're seeing so many negative things happen um, in our world. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to your point about the young people and, you know, is there still space? How do we still create hope? Um, in this twin pillar moment um, of perhaps despair and hope, uh -huh. it kind of takes me to, to the work you've done, uh, the amazing work you've done with the Maya Angelou um, Life and Legacy Project. Um, I know she's a daughter of Arkansas. I know she is a proud daughter of Arkansas. Can you share with us a little around what motivated you um, what is your big purpose with with you know keeping her life and legacy alive and and perhaps just you know some examples of how that life and legacy has shaped the youth of of Arkansas? Sure. She died in 2014 and uh, shortly after she passed, um, I was kind of angry because the state of Arkansas didn't see a need to, celebrate her life. And I went around asking people, are we doing anything to celebrate her life? This woman who is a, a global icon, uh, she was ours, she was part of us and um, there was nothing happening. So I went to this, the mayor of Stamps, that's where she spent much of her childhood and talked with him. And at the time he had nothing planned. So I talked him into basically, Let's yeah. do something. Let's celebrate her life. This woman is known all over the world and people adulate her. So uh, we did. We had a day of celebration for Maya Angelou's life. And it was statewide. People came from all over. And after that, we knew we had to do more. 
So we created this nonprofit, the Celebrate Maya Project. And our yes. goal was to do what we thought Maya Angela would want us to do. And that was to go into the schools, go into the communities and find a way to impact young people by bringing in programs, uh, literary programs, uh, poetry programs, art programs, writing and history programs. So that's what we've been doing. And we also do small scholarships for um, academic scholarships and poetry awards. We partner with schools. We have a partner school that we work with for two years at a time, but we yeah. always, we always identify Stamps High School, the school in Stamps, Arkansas. They will always be our partner. So we are doing what we can to impact young people, to help lift their voices, help them know that they're is a future. I mean, if if they want one, there's a future for them. We want them to know that we are always here if we can help in any way, but also to know that they can help themselves. We try to bring out people because a lot of times in poor areas, there's just not exposure to people who can do, who look like you. So we try to do that. We try to take people out into the communities to tell their stories and share with the young people. We make it a village affair. We work with the village, not just the young people. Uh, we yeah. make sure that we identify the school leadership, the community leadership, the parents, so that we can work with a village because those are the people who nurture those children when we're not there. So we need to partner uh -huh. with them. So we're very excited about what we've been able to do. We're still small, but we're we're growing. That's fantastic, Janice. And I know that the wonderful uh, Maya Angelou also paid a tribute to another icon and beacon of hope in the world, Nelson Mandela. Yes. Um, can you share a little around the connection between Maya Angelou and Mandela and what you read in her wonderful poem and tribute, I think it was called Testimonial, uh, to Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I do know that I think Maya Angelou was global before it was even a thing. She spent much of her time in Africa because she really believed in knowing her roots, knowing where she came from. And she mm -hmm. loved having that, that uh, affiliation, that association uh, to Africa. And of mm -hmm. course, she loved Nelson Mandela. We all did. Um, and I think what she was saying in that testimonial was that he was considered by African-Americans, but all Americans, as the leader, the model leader uh, for the world, because he gave so much of himself. And he came to pres his presidency when we needed him to be uh, a model for the world. And he, he just did such an amazing job in that position. And I think we all um, here in Arkansas, for sure, we all mourned his loss. Uh, I know I wrote an essay about it. A lot of my friends who are writers wrote essays about his passing uh, because we saw that as I think my title was When a Tree Falls. I mean, we saw this as a giant leaving the world, but he yes. so much. And that's what Maya said. He left so much for us to follow in his footsteps. His footsteps yeah. are large, but they're there for us if we'll follow in them. Absolutely. And, you know, to that point, and, and by the way, Janice, I would love you to share that essay if you'd be willing to, to send it to me. I'd, I, I will. It. I'd be grateful for that. And I can also share that with our audience out there. I think it's a remarkable tribute and I look forward to reading that. You know, you make you make such an important point around, you know, he he shared so much and, uh, you know, he passed on a remarkable legacy. Can you take us back to a very precise, specific moment, perhaps a Mandela moment for you that stands out? When was it? How did you feel at the time? And, you know, what was that moment of inspiration? Uh, but perhaps take us back first to that moment in time. Uh, can you paint a picture for us? I worked for President Clinton as his personal diarist, which means that I shadowed him quite a bit. And sometimes I traveled with him. And the trip that was most 
transformational for me was his trip to Africa, where he visited nine different countries in Africa. And one of the most memorable, if not the most memorable, was the South African trip. And Mm -hmm. I remember specifically the uh, state dinner that was held uh, in South Africa and the president and 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 the two presidents, President Clinton and President Mandela, we were under a huge tent and it started raining, uh, but it was magical. It was magical for me for so many reasons. But uh, the president had this thing, President Clinton had this thing about anytime any uh, head of state came to the White House or if I met them anywhere, he would make sure he introduced me to them and he would share my story with them because he just always thought my story was phenomenal. So that's what he did. He was sitting there at dinner, this state dinner with President uh, Mandela. And he said, Janice, come on, come on over here. I want to introduce you uh, to Mr. Mandela, President Mandela. And he did. And he shared my story with him. And Mr. Mandela was so very gracious. And he asked me a couple of questions about my life. But that was like um, a dream for me to actually meet this giant, this man that everyone had so much love and respect for. And I was in Africa. And that was the other dream. It was I wrote about it. I've written about it, of course. Uh, So that, I think, was such a transformational period for me. Um, I was able to meet this giant. I was able to meet him with someone who I admired so much, President Clinton. And the fact that these two giants of men became really, really close friends um, was really miraculous for me because Bill Clinton is from my home state from Arkansas. So he becomes a very good friend to the world's president, uh, President Mandela. So it's very, it it was very touching. And the next time that I saw President Mandela was in uh, the White House. And I think every, a lot of people know that he gave a speech in the White House about President Clinton when he was going through his his period. Um, Yeah. Uh, in the White House. And that was such an amazing speech. I was sitting there. There was probably not one dry eye in the audience after President Mandela spoke about his friend, Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just coming back to South Africa, what, what year was that? And can you remember the words that President Mandela shared with you? Oh, my goodness. That was 1997, I think. And I can't remember the exact words, but I may have them written down. So I'll look for them. And and if I can find them, I'll share them with you. That will be wonderful. And, and, you know, if you could perhaps take us a little deeper around when you said it was a moment of great transformation, what was the significance of that moment? How did that moment change you? I think it had something to do with what I said earlier about politics and government and leaders and my wrestling with how do you make politics and leadership and good leadership and good leaders, how do you make mesh it all together? And I think that moment was when I said to myself, yes, there are great leaders who are good people. That doesn't mean you have perfection in leadership. But there are leaders who want to do good by themselves and by the world and by the people they serve, their constituents. That is foremost in their minds and in their hearts. And those two men, I truly believe, neither one do I believe are perfect for sure, but I believe in their hearts. uh, There is that desire to do good by the world and by themselves. You know, you raise such an important point. I, I remember that speech, actually, when President Mandela came to the White House. It was a very, very difficult time. I was wondering, Janice, if there was something in terms of perhaps you could describe that moment. What do you think created that transformational shift out of a very, very difficult time for President Clinton you know, and, and Madam Secretary of State Hillary Clinton you know, what was it about that moment and what do you think helped 
the people present and President Clinton and his family kind of pivot out of that? What did Mandela share that changed and transformed that moment? I think basically, and, and again, I can't remember all the words that he used, but basically I think he painted a picture of a human being and someone that he hugely admired. First, yeah. And he named the reasons why he admired, admired him. And this is a Mandela. This is Nelson Mandela saying, this is a friend of mine. I admire him. He's done so many amazing things, good things. No, he's not perfect, but he has done enough for you to look at this part of it as you're looking at, you know, the legal questions that they had. Uh, yeah. So I think it was the fact that it was Nelson Mandela saying this and basically saying, he's my friend. My, I'm, I'm keeping my arm around him no matter what you say about him, because I think I know it's hard. And I, I think he actually said that, that he knew it's hard. Uh, so yeah. I think that helped a lot of people recalibrate, you know, the way that they were looking at this whole, you know, whole event, whole issue. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people came out of that saying, oh, this makes a difference. This really makes a difference. So in this world where we often have this demand for perfection and, and we often stigmatize mistakes, and, you know, in Mandela's own words, he, he said, I'm not a saint, I'm a sinner who keeps on trying. What do you think the lesson is, Janice, for, for leadership in the world today where we still tend to stigmatize mistakes and, and demand perfection and are often incredibly harsh when people make mistakes and err, uh, which we all do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just think humanity, I mean, if, if I came from the Bible perspective, all of the people who were considered not saints, but followers of Jesus, these were Jesus's uh, comrade, comrades, uh, none of them were perfect. All of them had their own problems. All of them had things about them that, you know, individually you would say, oh, no, he's a sinner one way or another. He's killed people or he he's a womanizer or, you know, all of them had their problems, but they were they were able to overcome those problems because their hearts were in the right place. They put whatever uh, weaknesses they had behind them and decided they were going to do the right thing. And I think if we can look at leadership as when we have the right leadership and we know that they are after the right thing, they're wanting to do the right thing, uh, their goals are to make the world better. Then I think we, uh, we, we, as the old people said, we cut off our nose to spite the face when yeah. we try to make people perfect. And if they're not perfect, we don't want their leadership. I think yeah. that's a huge mistake because mm -hmm. there are no perfect people, period. And some of the best leaders are imperfect people. So mm -hmm. I think that's, I, I really think we should not be hypocritical enough to think that the one leader is better than the other one because he didn't do a certain thing. There's no perfection in, in leadership or in human beings, either one. Yeah. You know, you've you've had a you've had an amazing life. And I think, you know, traveling from the cotton field to the White House is is a remarkable journey. And of course, working with President Clinton and going through some of those very difficult, challenging times. What for you has been a highlight of, of that experience? I think a highlight is just realizing that leaders and people who have so much power that they get up and they put their pants on one leg at a time and they make mistakes, but they can tomorrow, they can do something great after that mistake. 
And realizing the humanity of leadership, I think, is what is important to me. Um, Just knowing that no one is perfect, but everyone has the opportunity to be larger than they are, become better than they are. Um, I had a lot of aha moments. Uh, Those eight years that I worked for President Clinton, I loved the fact that I was able to witness his history firsthand, that I sat in the room and listened to all kinds of leaders uh, meet with the president, talk to the president, uh, that I saw government and leadership in action every day. Uh, That was that was a. That was huge for someone who worked in the cotton fields and came from, you know, dire poverty. It was huge. And I woke up every day pinching myself. When I walked into the White House, I knew that this was an honor and I I took it seriously. That is remarkable. And are there any other particular moments uh, that, that really stand out apart from those Mandela moments? There were lots of, I mean, I met so many leaders. I've met lots of leaders. I I sat in the room when President Clinton made some pretty uh, amazing decisions. Um, Lots of hardships during that time. The president went to a lot of funerals and and did a lot of uh, eulogies. uh, And each one he personalized and made it, you know, personal to that family. I saw that. And those things that I saw just made me know that his heart was always in the right place. Um, The people that I met coming in to visit the president, uh, some of them came with some very sad stories uh, and they would go into the Oval Office and meet with the president and they'd come back out with such hope. Um, So that he had this special thing about about, uh, touching people's hearts. He was able to do that. Uh, Mm -hmm. I worked with a lot of people who went on from the White House to do great things. So I I think it was it was a very special moment. Uh, There were people who came there to make a difference in the world. That's what I felt good about during that time. There were people who really wanted to do good and make a difference in the world. And I just I always think now I hope uh, just half if half of the people who go into the government uh, and the White House and the in the Congress, if they could go there with the will and the desire to make positive difference in the world, we would be in pretty good shape if just half of them did that. Do you, I mean, Mandela lived in a certain context and age and, and a time, and as you mentioned, Janice, you know, he, he was celebrated as being the right person and the right president at the right time. Do you think uh, Mandela's leadership is still relevant today? And if so, how and why? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, for one thing, his ability to forgive after mm-hmm. everything that had happened to him yeah. uh, was unbelievable. Uh During our trip to Africa, we visited Robben Island and I went into his cell with President Clinton and it was not, uh, it was, it was a hard thing to actually see how small the cell was and to know that he had lived there for all those years. Um, And then he came out and forgave the people who put him there. God, how, how, how. Much further along could we be if people had that feeling or that heart to forgive and to um, raise up people who have done wrong uh, as human beings. You did wrong. You're a human being. I'm forgiving you. Let's move on. Let's all move on together. I think Mm -hmm. that's what he asked for. If we could do that in the United States in South Africa, in every country, this world would be so much better. Absolutely. And what do you think, what do you think Nelson Mandela would say to the leaders, not only of America, but of the world today? We're just wasting so much time hating each other, fighting each other, trying to gain power 
whether we deserve it or not, we need to be about fixing the world. I think that's what he would say. We need to put all of this energy that we're using to tear each other down and hate to fixing the world because there's a whole generation watching us and needing our leadership. I think that's what he would say. Coming back to your amazing work around hope and creating and inspiring that hope, not only in, in the Delta area and in Arkansas generally, but, but in the United States of America and in the world, what do you think is the greatest wisdom you could pass on to the younger generation? How do they hang on to hope? What is it they should be putting in place to find that hope in their life? Wow. Well, I'm a huge proponent of education. Um, mm -hmm. And I know over the last 50 years or so, I've been, you know, people are saying, well, education isn't the most important thing anymore. But I think education is a foundation that our young people need. They need that. Um, I'm so afraid of technology, how it's impacting young people. I know technology is important, but um, I think it has a lot of negativity. And I would say to parents, please, can you know, restrict, if possible, how much technology your children are coming in contact with every day. So mm -hmm. I think the less they come in contact with some of the technology, some of the social media, uh, I think the better off our young people would be. Uh, I think hope is something that, first of all, Parents have to work toward, they have to try to give that to children. They have to show them every day uh, that you wake up with hope. I was just telling someone the other day that was complaining about life and they're saying, I'm giving up. I'm, you know, I'm just tired of, I said, go to sleep, go to bed, go to sleep. When is it that waking up in the morning doesn't give you hope, doesn't tell you Whatever you were thinking the day before, things can be better. I, I want parents to tell children that, yes, things may look horrible today. Go to bed, wake up. Let's look at it again tomorrow. I think mm -hmm. things will look different. Um, mm -hmm. So they need that from parents. They need leaders to talk to them, to, to, to show them what leadership is, to show mm -hmm. them um, how they could contribute to a better well, world as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a village. It's that whole village thing uh, for a whole country. The parents, the leaders in the community, and it's the national leaders as well. And right now, uh, the national leaders aren't doing a really good job. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if our national leaders aren't stepping up, you know, we need to draw on other people in the village you know, so apart from parents, um, are there other people in the village that you sure. think helped you and could help our youth today? Yeah, there are teachers and teachers. Uh, I know they're getting pulled and pushed and everything else, but teachers play such an important role uh, in children. And, you know, that brings up the whole COVID pandemic that's had children at home and a lot of them not learning and a lot of them uh, suffering because they don't have that, that security of going to school every day and having their family, um, their friends and having that teacher. Uh, so teachers play a very integral part. When I think about people who impacted my life, I'm always thinking back to a teacher who, yeah. who made a difference. So teachers yeah. and even uh, uh, religious leaders, spiritual leaders, uh, yeah. because faith, I do believe, is a big part of what yeah. we need. Yeah. So shifting slightly, um, I know with your wonderful husband, you co-founded a publishing company. And of course, you know, the power of the pen is uh, is something that you have not only lived, but supported others in doing. And of course, Mandela once said, a, a good head and a good heart are a formidable combination, but when you add the power of the pen and the written word, you have something truly special. 
in your world, Janice, what is the gift of our, you know, the power of the pen, the written word, um, or what we call as, you know, being word smart? Uh, you know, what what is the importance and gift of that? And how would you encourage the leaders of t- today to become more skilled and adept in that area? Just briefly. I mean, I know that's your life, a lot of your life work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I I just think it is so important. Writing is important because it opens up your brain and it allows you to think more clearly when you write things down. And I think that starts at a young age. I think um, I think leaders should encourage uh, young people to write. Writing and literacy are so important. Um, I think reading is important. I, I'm not going to go into the whole thing that we're going through now, where a lot of the books and the the curriculums are being uh, banned from our schools. So that's a whole nother problem. But writing is important because that's how we record our history. That's how we share stories about our lives and other people's lives and our cultures. Uh, and our children won't get that unless we write that down. Um, yeah. I, I, I did something not too long ago about the power of, of art in diversity and, and how we uh, create equity uh, by the arts and by writing and by books. That's how you make people know that we're all here. We're all important and our stories are important. So our leadership, they have to get that. I mean, because you deal with people now more than ever, you're dealing with people from all different cultures. So you need people who believe their stories are important. And as leaders, you should make sure that you encourage that. Just a couple of fun facts. I, I, know, I know you mentioned you you come from a family of 19. Uh, that's, that's a remarkable village there and there. What was it that you most enjoyed about your childhood village with your siblings? I think because we were so close, we're a very close family. We still are. We do family reunions every year. So uh, we're close and our best friends are usually a sibling. Uh, So we didn't have to depend on other people always for that friendship. Uh, We loved Christmas because my parents made it very special. We didn't get a lot, but it was still like a magical time for us. So uh, holidays and just the closeness of our family. Could you share one thing that perhaps happened in the White House in your time there that isn't really known, that is a a fun, memorable event? There were so many. The president did a radio address. I'm not sure everybody knows that. Every Saturday, he would do a radio address and he would invite in people uh, to come to the radio address. And there were usually maybe 100 people that came in every Saturday. And I was part of his Oval Office staff, so I was kind of help staff that. And once, uh, one year, uh, this lady came in, he'd invited her in. And for some reason, I didn't know it then, he walked to the front of the White House, the, the door to the White House, and he escorted her back to the Oval Office where he gave his Oval Office uh, addresses. And he sat there and talked to her. And then he announced in the radio address that the, the lady was 103 years old. She had wow. worked for Mamie Eisenhower. She had been a seamstress for Mamie Eisenhower, but she had written and said that she had never gone through the front door of the White House. So the president said, we are going to invite you here and you are coming through the front door of the White House. So he personally escorted her in. And that is just one of the things that uh, I remember very vividly, the big smile on her face. I have that picture of him uh, kind of stooping down, talking to her. She was in a wheelchair and just saying, we are so proud to have you inside this White House and in the Oval Office. She'd never, of course, been to an Oval Office either. That is that is such a wonderful story, Janice. And uh, perhaps one, one last fun fact, anything in particular about Maya Angelou that you don't think is really known that is something pretty memorable about her life and legacy? Wow, she she had such a full life. 
A lot of people don't know that she spent a lot of times in time in Ghana. Uh, she was actually married to a, an African man. An African man from Ghana? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, she also, at I guess she was about 15 or 16 years old when she left Stamps. She moved to San Francisco with her mother and she became the first female uh, conductor or not conductor, but engineer on the, tr I guess they called it ales or trams or it was the train. Uh, she became the first person, first woman or female to work on a train um, in San Francisco. In, her, in, her, uh, in San Francisco. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And she was, there's so many things about her that were first. And she was very confident. She had a lot of confident confidence and would try things uh, just because she wanted to see if she could do them. And that's, I think, how she became such an amazing woman. Um, her poetry, she started when she was in Stamps, Arkansas, and she just became world renowned for her poetry. I don't know whether people know that she went through a very hard childhood at a very young age. She was um, sexually uh, abused. And that ended up with her being mute. She did not talk for five years. Uh -huh. And which is hard to believe someone who had such a voice, such a presence eventually. Uh, and she, her words became who she is, the way uh -huh. she spoke and the words that she wrote. Uh, but it all came out of some pain, some real harsh pain when uh -huh. she was a child. Wow. And what remarkable words, I mean, she shared and how she, you know, transitioned into speaking her voice with such power. I guess it sort of raises the question to what extent is the adversity and, and the obstacle the way? Yes. Well, writers, they, they pull on that a lot. I mean, we pull on our joy. I mean, the things that make us uh, happy and proud. But there's something about... Uh, pain and adversity that really uh, gives us permission to write that that makes it easier for us to write and and if we are courageous enough to share it yeah sometimes yeah. that is the mo more evocative stories that we write yeah yeah absolutely so Janice in our kind of uh, final closing moments today are there any final thoughts you have about the current state of leadership and being able to lead boldly into the future and any final thoughts that you have that you think President Mandela would, would say to not only our, our generation and leaders in the world, but, but to the future leaders of the world? Mm -hmm. I guess my thoughts about our current leaders is get out of your own way and yeah. make the future your goal. Start thinking about what the world is going to look like 20 years from now and work toward that. And for the future leaders, and I know children were so important to President Mandela. I think if he cried, if he looked at today, it would be for the children to think about the fact that life looks really, really hopeless right now in a lot of ways. So he would say, Keep hope alive. Keep believing that tomorrow is going to be better and you can be a part of making certain that it's going to be better. Do your part. Whatever it is, whatever gift it is that you have, use that gift to make this world a better place. I think that's what he would say to our future leaders. Well, Janice, what a great gift to be having this conversation with you. I so look forward to sharing and doing more with you. And thank you for being part of this amazing village that truly inspires hope, not only in Arkansas, but around America. And of course, for the greater gift of the world. I can't wait to break bread with you in person. Thank you for being the inspiration that you are. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your words of great wisdom. Thank you so much, Anne. It's been a pleasure. Talking to my good friend Janice Kearney reminds us that great leaders are word smart and great storytellers. Janice chronicles her own powerful story in a book titled Cottonfield of Dreams. 
It's a poignant and inspiring memoir that takes us on a journey from the cotton fields of Lincoln County in Arkansas all the way to the West Wing of the White House, where she served as former President Bill Clinton's personal diarist. In fact, Bill Clinton wrote the foreword to her book. As an accomplished and prolific author, as a publisher, and the visionary custodian of her literary icon, Dr. Maya Angelou's legacy, she founded and is president of the Celebrate Maya Project. I recently had the joyful good fortune of celebrating Maya Angelou with Janice in Little Rock in Arkansas at the grand Bill Clinton Presidential Library. Bright blue skies, warm sunshine, excited friends, family, and supporters and mentees of Maya traveled from near and far to celebrate her 96th birthday, her powerful work in the world, and the 10th anniversary of the Spirit of Maya Awards. Dr. Maya Angelou's story is a testament to the personal strength of the human spirit and to the transformational power of language, literature, and words. During her turbulent childhood, she briefly returned to her mother's care at age seven and was raped by her mother's boyfriend, Mr. Freeman. Freeman was put on trial, sentenced, jailed, and subsequently released. And just four days after his release, he was killed. As a young child, Maya believed that it was her testimony, her words, her voice, that had effectively killed a man. She became a volunteer mute for six years. She had a voice, but she didn't use it except to speak to her beloved brother, Bailey. What she did do was develop a passionate love affair with language, literature, and words, including falling in love with William Shakespeare. That love affair became her soothing balm for her childhood pain and a great, poetic, word-smart global icon was born. In 1969, at age 41, Maya Angelou launched her first autobiography titled, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. A story that was as joyful and painful and mysterious and memorable as the essence of her childhood itself. It poignantly captured her childhood, the abandonment and longing of a lonely child the brutal bigotry of a small southern town and the wonder of words that can make the world light, bright, and bright. Maya went on to publish seven autobiographies, three books of essays, and numerous poetry books. She found her powerful voice. She is credited on a list of movies, of plays, and television shows spanning over 50 years and was awarded more than 50 honorary doctorates. Nelson Mandela met and knew Maya Angelou. Mandela once said that a good head and a good heart are always a formidable combination. But when you can add a literate tongue or pen, that is when you have something very special. Maya Angelou's work comforted Mandela when he was in prison. And he read her world-renowned poem, Still I Rise, at his presidential inauguration on May the 10th, 1994. And I quote, You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. You too, like Janice Kearney and like the late and great Dr. Maya Angelou can rise. You too are poetic and powerful. You have the power of your pen and the power of your voice. So when will you write your story or rewrite your story so that it connects with you, that it connects with now, and it extends beyond your circle to connect with others, to galvanize and change our world. Great leaders are word smart and great storytellers. You need to write or rewrite your story. So until next time, take care and take thoughtful, bold action.
just one small step at a time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leading Boldly into the Future. Please find links and connections mentioned in this show in our blog and never miss an episode by subscribing at ann-pratt.com. That's A-N-N-E-P-R-A-T-T dot com. May these insights from inspiring industry leaders, remarkable disruptors, and courageous champions of change bring forth a brand new you, emboldened, empowered, and ready to inspire hope. Come back soon. Share with your friends. Sign up on ann-pratt.com and join our movement for change. Why? Because the world needs you to lead boldly too.